Thank you. Thank you, Mark, Mike, Bill. Thanks, everyone. It is good to see you here today. Uh, welcome to, oh, he's sneaky sometimes there. Welcome to Woodville in the summertime. It's that time of year when the teachers look a little more relaxed. Educators, thanks uh, for that time. The parents, though, uh, are probably starting to go like, wait, 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 wait. I've got these kids full time. And so some are headed out of town and traveling. It's also that time of year, you know, where you get out of your well air conditioned car or pickup. And if you have glasses, they fog up. Just want to warn you on that. But it's also the time of year we celebrate uh, God doing some great things in our children's ministry and student ministry with things that are happening. Uh, Mark announced the things that are coming up uh, for our camps. Uh, I know that I'm the only thing standing between you and a good lunch uh, in our Family Life Center. You're all invited if you're a guest with us. We hope you'll stay for that. Uh, It's a free lunch, so you can't beat that one, but we want to have you here for that, but a fundraiser for our children's camp, which is happening in a few weeks as well. Uh, Billy and the students are getting ready to go to uh, youth camp in July, but this week is vacation Bible school, right? And so you can already tell from the decorations behind me, uh, there will be somewhere around 2,000 uh, children running, it'll feel like it, running through the building in a bit. Uh, but we're excited about those that will be here for that time. All that is hopeful things that are happening because we're in the midst of a, of a time where, you know, you can watch news, whether it be half a world away, half a state away. It doesn't take long to feel like there's much to grieve about and to feel like there's a mess uh, that's happening. Uh, And it can be possible to miss the future God intends by grieving about the mess we're in at the moment. Uh, You've heard me say it often. We, as people of faith, people of God's Word, people who know we were sinners needing to be saved, We're the folks that on the planet are the ones that ought to be least shocked that this place is broken and in need of salvation. Uh, We admitted it personally. We admit it for all those around us. And so we're going to look at a text today that's part of the text that is is in the study of Vacation Bible School out of the life of David. We'll be there in a bit. It's going to be in 1 Samuel 16 if you want to kind of get an advance uh, heading toward that one. But We're going to talk today about the reach of a child and how there is this work of God that's moving forward in lives. Now, when I say the reach of a child, you might think, well, what about that warning label they put on some things sometimes that say, keep out of reach of children, right? I learned with my kids, that meant I needed to like take it down to NASA and have them put it on a rocket and send it to outer space, because that's the only place out of the reach of children, right? Right? I mean, they they can get anywhere into anything because there are no boundaries for them. They don't live life in this idea that there's something they cannot do. And maybe there ought to be a bit in us as followers of Christ with that same attitude and activity that there's nothing beyond our grasp when we have Christ within, right? That's the way we ought to think as well. So, Again, we live in a world where there are messes. Some you've maybe made your own. Uh, We've all made mistakes, some very terrible perhaps. Some might disqualify a leader and destroy the lead. Some might lead a life so far astray that it can feel so distant from family and friends, but it's never beyond the grasp of God and the redemption of Christ. Samuel's anointing of Saul that we look at today uh, uh, revealed how God sees uh, the way that uh, a, a family or a nation can move forward because then he moves from Saul's anointing to David's anointing and shows that there's a way forward for a nation of family and faith. So this week of Vacation Bible School has within it a declaration that uh, the church sees children as precious to God and a part of his work of salvation. Lives can be changed forever because of this week's efforts. I've seen that happen, and I look forward to that. I've I've pastored where I've seen kids go home after hearing about Christ and telling their mothers, their fathers, their grandparents about what they've learned. And I've seen whole families come to faith in Christ because of Vacation Bible School. So I want to ask you to pray for Vacation Bible School. Vacation Bible School... 
uh, has an historic and a present impact. Many of you that are here today, uh, you, were, you were led to Christ going to a vacation Bible school or a Bible camp or something at your church, right? That's part of your story. Many of you are here are volunteering in Vacation Bible School this week. In fact, I would like to ask this of you. You'll know I'm not big on trying to embarrass you often or in anything like that, but if you're somehow a part of the Vacation Bible School effort, you know, that is, if you are in leadership, if you're volunteering, if you're bringing cookies, if you're one of the kids that are coming, if you're, I mean, if you're engaged in Vacation Bible School this week, would you stand? That's a lot of you. I just named family, leadership, workers, volunteers. You see, you're not going to stay standing. I know you. I've been here long enough. They're like, we don't want that. Just go ahead and raise your hand then because there's more of you that didn't stand, right? The engagement in Vacation Bible School is wide and deep here in the things that happen. And the theme verse for it's here on this board. It's on the screen, a couple of different versions, but which says, we are God's handiwork created in Christ Jesus to do good works, which God prepared in advance for us to do. I mean, we ought to remember that God is creator and God's creativity has no bounds within our lives when it works through us. So we move into a story today about moving forward from the life of Samuel and David. And moving forward is is hard to do sometimes. But, you know, it's what needs to happen in lives a lot. And now, in any community, it's, it's easy to feel like you can't move forward because maybe you have a reputation or you have a way people know you. I mean, I was told this sentence when I, when I moved to Woodville. It was, welcome to Woodville where everybody's business is everybody's business. And I kind of chuckled because I'm like, well, I've heard that other places. It's, it's the way we work. We, life is out there and people make their idea of what things are going to be based on what things have happened in the past in our lives, but God can do radical, fresh new work in everyone's life. It doesn't matter whether you feel you've been faithless or faithful to God's work in your life, you can be used by Him today. 1 Samuel 16 is a story fresh on the heels of Saul failing to do what God had ordered him to do. God has been declared as the one who said, I want you to go. These Amalekites, they've had their shot. Their king, uh, Agag, all those that are there, says, I want you to take everything about them and in a way consecrate it to God. It's a difficult thing for us to say, but he says, basically, I want you to, to wipe everything out about them, destroy, devour, demolish, and kill all there, God says. It's a difficult story for us, but remember, we're New Testament people. But in this uh, Old Testament story here, it may be hard for us to look at, but there's some redemption that can happen even at the hand of the sword in the way God worked in that day in time. The last, as you heard me say it last week, necessary act of violence that needed to happen to bring about peace between God and man happened on the cross. Do you hear that? That was that last necessary act that happened, the death of the Lamb of God, the Son of God. But in this sense of consecrating is what he's saying. Turn, God, he says, I want you to consecrate them all to the sword. He says to do that, but instead Saul feels like his judgment's a little better than God's, Right? And maybe if you're not familiar with this story, he kind of looks at everything. He's going, well, maybe I shouldn't kill their king. And maybe their, their good livestock, you know, the good stuff, we shouldn't destroy that. It's kind of like somebody that shows up at a junkyard and they're said, hey, we want you to just crush every car. And you get there and you go like, well, surely not that 57 Chevy. No, we're not going to do that. Or not that nice pickup. We're not going to do that. That one, man, it still looks like it can work well. And so you kind of set that aside and you just get the old rust buckets and crush them. That's basically what Saul did. He thought he had a better plan than God. And so the real gist of it is, is coming back from that, Samuel confronts him and said, look, God said because you didn't obey him, you can't be king anymore. You have failed. And so Samuel has let that be known, and he goes home, and he says he doesn't see Saul again until the day 
of his death, but he's grieved over what Saul the king had done for Israel. And there's, there's more to the story, a little bit of background here, not to bore you too much, but that story about Agag and that failure to get rid of the Amalekite shows up again in a little, little book in the Bible called Esther there. So when God gives the command to leadership, there ought be obedience that ought happen. But moving forward is hard from disobedience. It's hard to do. So in chapter 16, Samuel is told to go and anoint a new king. Verse 1, God says to him, how long will you grieve over Saul? I have rejected him from being king over Israel. And he says, get your horn, fill it with oil, and go to the house of Jesse the Bethlehemite, for I provided myself a king from among his sons. And we pick up in the fifth verse, it says, then he goes there, and, and he's, he's afraid on the journey. He's afraid for his life. I mean, think about what's happening. It's basically a coup underway. You've got a king on the throne, and he's going to pick another king. And Samuel is afraid for his life. And so under the guise of going to offer sacrifice, not that he is lying about it, he goes to Bethlehem. And as he gets there, uh, in order to obey, he goes there. He says he consecrates Jesse and his sons, and he invites them to the sacrifice. He goes to Bethlehem, that place there. And Jesse brings them in and says, when they arrived, Samuel saw the sons. He's skipping down a little bit. He says, when they arrived, Samuel saw Eliab and thought, surely the Lord's anointed stands here before the Lord. But the Lord said to Samuel, do not consider his appearance or his height, for I have rejected him. The Lord does not look at the things people look at. People look at the outward appearance, but the Lord looks at the heart. Now, again, y'all have heard probably many Bible studies, sermons, teachings on on this verse, and I have to just kind of let the cat out of the bag. That's not the core of this sermon today. For that truth is plain and evident, right? I mean, we will watch the divorce proceedings of people we think are pretty famous and care about how that turns out and not consider the disasters of so many marriages that end so difficultly. We will watch a sports star rise to fame while their personal life is decadent. We will worship folks that somehow are wealthy, thinking that they are the ones that can show us the way, knowing that every bit that they can make can turn to rust and dust. We elevate the wrong and miss out on the right. So you know that sermon. But the real story that's going on here is is the tension, the drama, the intrigue that's happening with Samuel making his way surreptitiously to Bethlehem into this home with Jesse there and saying, as he brings him here, this one who is this descendant of Ruth and Boaz, this one who is there in Bethlehem, and he comes in and he says, as he brings them there together, and he says, then Jesse called in Abinadab, another son, had him pass in front of Samuel. But Samuel said, the Lord has not chosen this one either. Jesse then had Shema pass by, but Samuel said, nor has the Lord chosen this one. Jesse had seven of his sons pass before Samuel, but Samuel said to him, the Lord has not chosen these. And Samuel does what you would do if you're on the phone to a helpline or somewhere and, and they, uh, like they can't answer your questions. He says, well, is there someone else I can talk to? He says, are these all the sons you have? Is this all? There is still the youngest, Jesse answered. I mean, the idea that uh, that young uh, age is one that can't have any great impact. In fact, really, when you look ahead to the next chapter, when the soldiers go to war against the Philistines, his father, even though he's been anointed, thinks he's really only good as the, uh, basically the Uber Eats guy to bring the bread and cheese to the brothers at the battlefront. That's all David's good for at that time. 
So here he, he says he's tending the sheep. Then Samuel said, send for him. We will not sit down until he arrives. Now in my, my mind's eye, I'm thinking like, oh, they're looking at that barbecue fixing to cook, man. Their mouths are watering. They, they are thinking the feast is about to happen. And now he's going like, oh, dude, we're going to have to wait hours now. I mean, it's not just a short thing for someone else to go and take care of all the sheep out in the field. I mean, it's not like they could hop in the pickup or the, uh, the side-by-side and rush out there and relieve him. No, somebody had to make the journey ready to stay for days to take care of the sheep. This wasn't just a quick job. And so they wait. And David comes in. And when he comes in, It says he was glowing with health and had a fine appearance and handsome features. Then the Lord said, rise and anoint him. This is the one. This is the one. So Samuel takes the oil and he anoints him in the presence of his brothers. And from that day on, the spirit of the Lord came powerfully upon David. Samuel returned back to Ramah. Would you bow with me in prayer? God, thank you for a time to be in your word today ever so briefly. Thank you for the eternal significance of it all. God, I thank you for what we might look at as just little children. We might make decisions on the impact of their lives ahead of time. But God, as this stage will fill up and this room will fill up with children this week, we know that there are those here that will make eternal decisions that will impact the world. And so we pray for them, God. Help our eyes be open and our hearts be patient. In Jesus' name I pray, and we all said, amen. You know, there's, like I said, there's a whole lot going on in this story, not the least of which is Samuel's anxiety here. I mean, he's just trying to get this done. I mean, he's scared for his life, if you think about that. It's that kind of a great story. But again, here's something great that he does. Unlike Saul, who thought he could decide for God, Samuel said, I need to obey God. This all needs to take place in God's time, in God's work, in God's way. And then, I like that last verse that I read for you that said, Then the Lord said. How many of you have had that blessed moment in life when you have waited for the then? You've had plenty of opportunity to say, this one's good enough. This opportunity, this place, this job, this decision... This relationship, this is one that, this looks great. And you went back and you said, I settled for less than the then. In life, we all need to realize God has the then for us. Now, it's not about what mistakes you might have made that totally dictate God's future. I mean, Samuel was the one that, had anointed Saul, and now he's off to anoint another. You can imagine the anxiety and trepidation he must feel. Is this going to be the right one? And he waits for the then. And when you wait for the then in your life, amazing things can happen with your anxiety. Now, we're going to have kids around here. And, and um, uh, again, we're, we're excited. We've got five grandkids and one more on the way. I mean, we went from like I think just walking daughters down the aisle and all of a sudden now there's grandbabies, man. It just like happens fast uh, that that happens. But one of the things I noticed in playing with little, little kids, little toddlers, is, you know, you know I, I get there on the floor, we're playing with like blocks and we're stacking them up. And I learned early on that, that the object isn't to make a great stack of blocks. The object is to make something that they can knock down. And they, they don't think anything about it. Doesn't bother them at all that, that Papa had made this great engineered structure. Because it's coming down. You see, kids don't get caught up in this idea that, that what's 
what's happened in the past has got to dictate what's going on in the future in such a way that it's a routine. You see, um, what, what's happening here with, with Samuel is he's learning that hope comes by closing out on the destructive works of your failures in your past. You can't, you can't keep doing the same thing the same way, hoping for different results. You can't do that. You know, if there's things that have been destructive in your life, stop! Get help! Listen to God. Get relationships. The idea of the community of the church is we all have admitted that we've been people who've done things that were destructive in our lives. It's called sin. And so called by him and set aside, we remember that. But it's so easy to get in routines. You see, this was only Samuel's second time to anoint a king, but he was already copying and pasting the way God had worked before on how God would work in the future. God is creative. I mean, it struck me years ago when I was reading about how they entered into the promised land and they get to Jericho and they march around it and they shout and they blow the trumpets and the walls come a-tumbling down, as the children's song said. And I thought, well, that's a great way to do it. Why didn't they just keep doing that all the time? Because God didn't say to do it that way all the time. We are not the people of a routine. We are not the people of rituals. We are the people that serve a creative, energizing, living, breathing God that does the unexpected for His glory. So again, a question is, if if you kind of feel like you've got some anxiety about a thing that's before you, ask yourself the question, are you trying to keep doing things like you were doing that before? And if you are, are you missing what God is doing forward because you're so focused on the past? I heard someone say sometimes that people often get excited about a project or a direction in their life, like sailors leaving port on a sailing vessel. And the wind fills the sails and it heads out in the direction that they're to go. And they are thrilled. Man, they're headed toward the destination that is before them. And the wind changes direction. And real smart sailors know you just change the sails in the direction of the ship a little bit. And it can keep moving. But imagine the sailors that went like, no, this is the direction we were headed. Break out the paddles. And so often in life, and in church and in organizations, that's what you see happen. Instead of capturing the wind of God, we depend on the strength of our arms to be faithful to keep this boat going in the direction it was going. That's not the way God works. Close out on the destruction of failure and then clarify that moment for focus in your life. Um, You know, a lot of times we ask the question, uh, why are we here, right? Why why are you here? And I'd say, ask not why are you here, but rather what is God working on here, right? I mean, see the greater significance of being connected to where God is working in your life. See, Samuel was doing his job, but he was looking after his own safety instead of God's focus. Because God's focus may be risky sometimes for you to make change that ought happen in life, but it will ultimately reveal God's work in your life and not your own. You know, Saul chose to play it safe, bring home the bounty from the Amalekite battle. But no, that's not what needed to happen. You see, we realize that we ought move forward even though it costs us our very lives. We have the greatest illustration of this in the life of our Savior Jesus, who on his knees in the Garden of Gethsemane the night before he was to be carried through trial and accusation and brutal whipping and a cross, prayed, God, is there some other way? But then said, nevertheless, God, not my will, but thine. 
that always inspired me when I go on a mission trip with a group of people and saying a prayer, I, I pray, dear God, please keep us safe except when being dangerous brings you glory. Some heads snap up often after that prayer. But the truth of the matter is it's in those moments of dangerous dependence upon God, not that we seek them out under our own direction, but under the guidance of God, it's when our dependence upon Him brings about His glory. And then the last thing there that you see is really way to build hope is not just to close out on destructive failure, not just to have a clear understanding of the focus of the moment, but also to claim that there really is a provision that God has for the future. This anointing work that, uh, that Samuel was going to do was a declaration of a movement forward. I mean, anointing was used to wash wounds for a healing. Anointing was used to cleanse a body for its burial. Anointing was used to mark a king to rule. It was a way that there is a movement beyond the moment. And from the moment Samuel's oil fell upon David, Saul was out. The Spirit came upon David, the text tells us. And the rest of the story you know oh so well. From the moment of your receipt of God's future grace upon you, the old ruler of your life is gone. I don't know how long it's been since you made a decision to believe that Jesus is the Son of God who died on the cross for your sin. And I don't know when you believed that. I don't know if it was decades ago or days ago or it needs to be today. But when that happens... When that filling of the Spirit, when, when you say, Lord, have mercy on me, a sinner, Jesus, come into my heart, you need to know what happens for you is that there is this anointing of God, this filling of you by His Spirit, this covering of His grace that declares the old ruler of disobedience is out of here and the new king has come. That's the good news. And that moves us forward in our lives. It helps us think about this. Some of you may be getting ready to travel on a trip this summer. And this is a simple thing, but what, what, when we're moving forward with God's grace upon us, we, we change what we're doing with our lives. Now, if you're going to go to someplace like, I don't know, say you're going to go someplace cold to get away from this heat and humidity, what do you put in your suitcase? What you're going to need there? Say you're going to travel somewhere down where you're going to be on a cruise, you're going to go to the beach, you, you pack the shorts and the sunscreen. You pack for where you're going, not for where you've been. That's why we get engaged in the study of God's Word, personally, corporately, together. We, we get prepared and packed for where we're headed together. For the ultimate truth is we all have errors, we all have pains that we've all got to move forward, away from. And we can do this together. I mean, imagine a guy that, uh, that killed someone for preaching Jesus Christ. Imagine a guy that was arresting people who were worshiping Jesus as the Messiah. Imagine that guy who then meets Jesus, acknowledges Jesus as Savior. Imagine that guy then going and proclaiming that Jesus to people all across the lands around Israel and Asia Minor and toward Greece and then to Rome. And you've imagined Paul. And Paul writes in Philippians 3, 12 through 14, I haven't already obtained everything. I haven't already arrived at my goal. But I press and take hold of that for which Christ Jesus took hold of me. Brothers and sisters, I do not consider myself yet to have taken hold of it. But the one thing I do, forgetting what is behind and straining toward what is ahead, I press on toward the goal to win the prize for which God has called me heavenward in Christ Jesus. I mean, that's where we're moving. We can't lament the mistakes of the past. We can't let our feet be frozen in the fear of the present. But we certainly can let 
the anointing of God pour upon the direction for the future. And that's why we pour ourselves into vacation Bible school, into kids, into families, into what God is doing. For if you and I have already been saved, it's not about us anymore. It's not about our comfort. It's about the cause of Christ. It's a reminder, there's always more to the story. For David, he goes on to sling rocks at a giant. What about you? What's in front of you? You see, the summertime travel is about to begin, and the question from the back seat is, it's universal, right? We, we all know that that's the question that gets asked. Are we there yet? My kids got tired of me saying, yeah, yeah, just over the next hill. Yeah, it's there. They just wouldn't ask anymore. And then probably the greatest gift of all was when we got a little TV that we could like let them watch stuff. But the thing is, is that when we travel, the question is not, the question that we ought to be asked is, are we there yet? But what is the question you are asking of God right now? I mean, as we're journeying through this together as followers of Jesus Christ, what is the question you are asking of God? Oh, there's going to be many. It may be, God, are we there yet? Or is, is there another? Is this all there is? You may say, God, when is the then? When we stand to close in song here in a bit and depart in a moment for a meal together, some may be asking the question, I want you to come into my life. I want, I want to be covered with Jesus Christ, with his grace gift that forgives sin and fills my heart to live for him. Now, if you want to talk about that, you can come forward while we sing. You can catch me after the service. Uh, we can visit this week about how it, what it is to follow Christ. Would you stand together as we move into a time of commitment? God, I thank you for this fellowship of believers. I thank you for uh, the opportunity to share faith. I thank you for the commitment to share the gospel among children and their families this week. Lord, we pray for your anointing, your blessing upon that. Uh, Lord, we ask for your hand upon our, our volunteers and our leadership with Vacation Bible School. Help them, Lord, as they, they prepare hard, as they get up early, as they serve through the day. God, fill them with a sense of strength and endurance that's just beyond their usual capacity. God, I pray for uh, the work that might, might be done, not only in Vacation Bible School, but across this summer, God, when we are uh, with anticipation waiting to see you change lives forever. But God, we pray for your work that's happening right now. As people have many questions, God, let them hear you say, I am working. Step forward. Move. Commit. Serve. Love. Forgive. Share. You answer the questions, O oh God. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen.